Hey guys, welcome to the third installment of our seminar on Simone de Beauvoir's The Ethics of Ambiguity. Um, so, what do we want to say first? I think the first thing we want to say is that, we mentioned this during the very first podcast, is that the Noetic app will be available very, very soon. Uh, we'll give instructions on how to download that, but I'm going to start be being, I'm going to uh, do a little bit of prelude for these podcasts and things like that. If you'd like to donate so that we can build yes, more courses, awesome. make more lectures, make more seminars and things like that to help you with your studies or just for your own intellectual engagement. Um, just hit that blue button on the app and you know you can give us 50 cents, you can give us $100, whatever, but um, just understand the more you donate, the more programming we can make. So I, that's all I'm gonna say. We should, um, I guess what we usually do is we kind of assess how we did in the previous podcast. I'm going to say, I think we did a pretty decent job. I, I usually, you know, I'm usually pretty hard on us. I thought we covered a lot of the basics. Yeah, I, um, I didn't really have any major objections to what we did. Um, well, how, how did you feel about how last podcast? You know, went? I didn't get a chance to do the the replay, um, sort of like the, the locker room studying, so to speak. But mm -hmm. um, here are a few things that I think it would be helpful for us to define. Which Please we do. Yeah, 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 sure. Let's see time. if I can do that. Uh, just sort of the, the jargon, uh, the for oneself and in oneself that she mentions a lot. I understood that as sort of like being and like cause, but I didn't know. I, I kind of wanted just to know your thoughts on it. For oneself and in oneself? Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm, I, I take a lot of my notes off of the, off the, off of my own lectures. So I don't, I didn't use that terminology. I think I mm -hmm. translate, I'm probably a little bit more removed from the text than you are. Cause I was sort of, I'm using my own materials to like prep for today. What it, can, do you have a, a passage maybe uh, or something like that? Or, yeah. or, or, cause then I could, I'd be better at probably assessing what she meant by those term, that terminology. I mean, I could guess, but I think my, my guessing would be unhelpful. Uh, and if it would take a second to find it, maybe we'll circle back around to it. Oh, okay, hold on. Uh, so this is a, a passage, and I'm sure, sure as I'm reading it, it'll probably click. Sure, but yeah, I'm going to read this passage. Why don't you read the whole passage? Uh, the first implication of such an attitude is that the genuine man will not agree to recognize any foreign absolute. When a man projects himself into an ideal heaven that, uh, I'm sorry, last line, uh, what? <laughs> sorry, into an ideal heaven that impossible synthesis of the for itself and the in itself that is called God, it is uh, because he wishes to regard of this existing being to change his existence into being. Oh uh, gosh, okay, here we go, just keep going. Um, but if he agrees not to be in order to exist genuinely, he will abandon the dream of inhuman objectivity. Right, so I didn't use that terminology because I didn't think it was helpful the way it's I found it extremely complicated. I think, all, look, all, all that she's really saying there is that when we covered this in the last podcast, all she's really saying there is that um, that the, 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 the man's essence is drained away if he's living for, for some sort of externally defined object, right? So if you're right. living for some kind of God or something like that, then you don't sort of cultivate the meaningful individuality that you would on the existentialist perspective. You're living for something else that has like, in, like everything has its teleology in it. I, I was listening to David Foster Wallace's um, infinite jests earlier today. And there was a neat turn of phrase that I encountered that I'd never encountered before. You've heard the expression ghost in the machine, right? This yeah. Like, I, I might've heard it like once or twice. It's yeah, like vaguely familiar. Right. This idea that like, the, I guess like in the 18th, the 18th, 19th century or whatever people began. And even today, modern neuroscientists and AI people start to, con start to think of individuals as like, uh, machine like beings or whatever mm -hmm. and that there's some sort of undefinable substance that's in it or whatever but he reversed it and he talked about uh the machine and the ghost that the individual mm -hmm. and i in, in this con context instead of rising ghost and machine the machine and the ghost is that our lives are really just totally inconsequential like that they're really just participating in this god that is going around playing chess with all the things that are in this terrestrial plane yeah, I'm mixing so many different metaphors there, but essentially... I mean, it's a cool idea, despite the... Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, the, the, the thing is with Simone, is she, I think she, her real concern, and I don't necessarily agree with her on this, her real concern is so long as there is an external object telling us what is right and wrong and issuing decrees of, of unconditional value, then we don't properly express our freedom and disclose our being and have, have, the, have the more meaningful existence that she seeks to 
um, bestow upon those who have converted to the existentialist perspective. Okay. All right. So, I mean, I could split hairs about it, but I mean, it's it's probably she's acknowledging some sort of indebtedness to, to Hegel or something like that. It's really not important. I mean, the, the main thing, like I said, is that you can't be externally determined, be it by collectivism, which we'll talk more about today, God, cultural mores, mm -hmm. uh, opinions, all of that sort of thing. Right. All right. So were there, was there more stuff that you wanted to go over? Um, I think that's pretty much it. All right. Well, let's jump into it. Um, so today we're going to cover uh, pages 18 through 40. Um, and uh, we'll just see how it goes. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do this in a pretty timely fashion. Um, so, so Simone starts off page 18 by saying, hey, look, this sort of existentialist conversion thing is not really that strange. We see this all the time. Like we see this in other philosophical movements. And do you, you recall what she says is an example of a philosophical movement that posits uh, conditional value, that sort of reacts to conditions in order to create new values, and that it's been legitimated, at least at this time, as sort of a viable alternative to capitalist society. That should be the, that should be the main dun, cue. Dun, Marxism. Right, right. But she, but what, what's your understanding of Simone de Beauvoir's relationship to Marxism? Do you think she has a a favorable view of it? Do you consider Simone de Beauvoir a Marxist? I think the thing is, is at least in American society, uh, people with a very superficial understanding of philosophers automatically think that they're Marxists, right? But for the record, I am not a Marxist. And I'm not a <laughs> and, and guess who else isn't? Simone. Right, right. And she's got some major problems with Marxism, and I think that's going to preoccupy us a lot with today's podcast, right? So I... They kind of bleed into one another, but at least I could, I could identi identify at least four problems that she's going to have with the Marxist, Marxist program. Now, she, she says that the Marxists are really good at like, understanding that you can sort of refashion what is good and bad. They understand that these, things are, are, these values are malleable, just like the existentialists do. Um, but she's got four problems. I, I've, I've outlined them here. They may only be two or three and they might sort of bleed into one another. What, what do you think some of the problems are that she has with Marxism? I think that, I mean, my, my favorite one was the fact that uh, Marxism, you know, there, there's, a, there's a really good quote and I thought it was interesting because obviously existentialism is all about, you know, freedom and the individual and Marxism says, well, guess what? We're actually sort of uh, slaves almost to the historical narrative. And for an existentialist, like that completely runs counter. And she... Uh, no, I, I can I, can I tease know. that out a little bit more? Yeah. Right. So, so I, Jordan has definitely hit on what I would consider the fourth objection that Simone de Beauvoir has to Marxism. I'm a historian, that's probably the one yeah. I just like... Just All right, like so... Zero. We're assuming that people at home have, a re and I'm, a, and you know, we we haven't done Marx, and to be honest, I right. really hope I would love for us to go page by page with the Communist Manifesto because cool. it is a really impassioned and incendiary book, and I don't think people understand it well enough. Well enough, both liberal and conservative, I think it's very easy for individuals to subscribe to it without understanding what they're subscribing to, and for conservatives to rebel against things that they actually might agree with. It's a dangerous book. It's a really volatile and disruptive book, as we've seen by, you know, we've seen with a lot of uh, what's going on in communist regimes and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> one of the big problems, and Kierkegaard sort of anticipated this with sort of all the Hegelian musings and things like that. What, what it, so on the Marxist perspective, the idea is that there is sort of this sort of historical arc, right? right. And that there is sort of this universal class struggle between the bourgeoisie and and the, and the proletariat, and eventually there are sort of think conditions that sort of work them out, and they're eventually going to be this bourgeois, or they're going to be this proletariat triumph that gets to sort of um, a collective estate that is going to be sought for and desired, right? But, but the problem is, when, and, and that is a remarkable simplification of what Marxism is, and do not use what I just said as your departure point for what Marxism is, because it's much more complicated than that. But <clears throat> in in Marxism, what tends to happen is that you tend to divide everybody up into the different group that they're a part of, right? right. And what is Simone's concern, right? If you start dividing people based up 
uh, based off of their their class distinction, what what can happen? Well, then the problem is that then the party then decides what your function is and starts imposing their objectives onto you. That's I have that as sort of a separate concern, but it is oh. it, they're kind of all the same. But the, yeah. the concern is is if you are swallowed up into subgroups of bourgeois and proletariat and things like that, the individual's life. Do you think it becomes more or less significant? Well, it definitely becomes less significant. Why does it become less significant? Well, because then you just become sort of a, a cog into like a different machine. Right, and, this is, and that's the whole thing that communism is objecting to, right? Because mm -hmm. they're viewing this sort of industrial revolution and all these changes, and they're seeing the proletariat becoming cogs in the capitalistic machine, right. right? And there are people being worked to death and alienated from labor mm -hmm. and blah, 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 right. blah. But we see with the communist program, and Simone is very, very acutely aware of this, is that the same thing is happening, that the, co the collectivist movement is asking individuals to die and suffer, get this, for a cause that may never attain. It may be the case. It is a pious hope that the communist utopia will come to be, right? Like, so you're asking individuals to go to war, to do bloody revolutions and things like that, and the thing that they're desiring, they may never even taste, right? Yeah. So the individual's life gets swallowed up into a political program. And that is going to be totally right. antithetical to an existentialist ethics and viewpoint, right? right? That is radically concerned with the individual's life. Yeah. Oh, actually, here, here's the quotation. Um, she's talking about uh, Marxism and freedom. So besides, in practice, Marxism, Marxism does not always deny freedom. The very notion of action would lose all meaning if history were a mechanical unrolling in which man appears only as a passive conductor of outside so, Elaborate on that. Why would it lose meaning? What's losing meaning if there are all it's these mechanical of, processes that are going on well, between It's like groups? what we've talked about with Augustine, right? If we don't have any volition or any will, then our actions in that system just become meaningless just because it's like a mechanized, thoughtless unconscious process. You know what else enter, enters into unconscious, thoughtless progress, uh, processes? What's that? Animals. Blind nature. Yeah. Think about deer. Deer just generate and generate and generate, and there's nothing significant about any of them, right? Because they're just really an elaborate sort of... We, I use the example of deer because there are lots of deer where we live out here in the country, and I go on these walks and I encounter deer all the time, but you would not... Like, people just shoot deer, they hit deer with their cars, I, they... Have, has any particular deer ever mattered to you? Bambi. Well, maybe Bambi, but, but why did Bambi matter to you? Because she was anthropomorphized, right. right? Like she was given a human personality. And I think what Simone is trying to say is the more that we make humans a process of blind mechanism, the less they lose their personality and become closer to matter. They become closer to dumb animals and less like people. The, the individual doesn't matter. And by the way, Simone is not, I have to contextualize Simone here. She is definitely borrowing a ton from Kierkegaard on this issue. Right. Kierkegaard was. She does mention him. Yeah, yeah. She does mention, I think the, in the reading today, she's mentioned him for the second time. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, she, so I, I imagine she was very familiar with this concern. Kierkegaard was railing against the Hegelians of his time. Um, because he did, Marxism hadn't come into existence yet. But if Kierkegaard had to identify the Marxist program, he would have lost his effing mind. He would have gone nuts. Been a fan. No, he wouldn't have been a fan <laughs> at all. So uh, we've gone on a little bit about that, and I mean, so and these others are these other concerns are sort of nested in that. Do you want me to enumerate, or do you want to take another stab at it? Yeah, why don't you enumerate? Okay. So um, I. Also, what she finds like really problematic with the Marxist program is that the Marxists, ironically, right, they're trying to fight for the proletariat, but they dehumanize the pro proletariat in the process. And we've talked about one way to dehumanize the proletariat in the sense that they reduce them to this force, this mechanism or something like that. But she says that it's remarkably simplistic because it universalizes the proletariat in such a way that it says the proletariat will be the same in every country at every time. And it doesn't, she says it doesn't recognize the diversity of the proletariat in different places. The proletariat in America can be very different from the proletariat in France or Russia or India or something like that. Right. And she makes a good point about how, you know, sometimes, uh, like, the American proletariat, she had accused of being kind of sleepy and sort of lazy. In Germany, she says that they were clearly misled. Right. 
and the thing, so why, why would that be a problem? So what happens if, if, if um, for Marx, if the proletariat is different everywhere? Well, I mean, then you can't... This is going to feed into other concerns I'm going to address. I mean, well, then it becomes really problematic when you try to apply universal models. Ah, and intensely localized. You can't centralize things, right? Yeah. If, you can't if, streamline it. Right. If you recognize a plurality mm-hmm. of, of dynamics going on around the world or whatever, guess what you can't have? Centralized party leaders, right? right? Mm-hmm. And if yeah. you can't have centralized party leaders, you can't have people setting the agenda for everybody. Right? right, and this is the yeah. other problem. This is the other problem that Simone de Beauvoir is going to have with Marxism is that it asks people who buy into Marxism to not do the ethical thinking for themselves. Right, and it's on the, ex- the party leaders. Yet too. you are going to essentially you are going to infantilize yourself because you're like whatever the people on top say is what I think. Right, right? I'm going to outsource my ethical thinking because I'm just a poor little proletariat and I can't think big. Because I'm going to think about, I'm going to let party leaders do that for me. Let me ask you this, Jordan. Mm-hmm. Do you see that in American society? Do you see anybody doing our thinking for us? I mean, what's the whole point of what we're making here, right? Yeah. We're trying to get people to think for themselves. Mm-hmm. Have, do, in America right now, do we have party leaders? Think about it. I mean, in the political realm. There's some demagoguery. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. On both sides. Yeah, yeah, on both uh, sides. And that's not to, you know, call it's sort of, one party out. No, no, no. It's not a Democrat versus a Republican thing. It Like, I mean, we, if we look at the political system right now, you've got probably, I bet you have Trump supporters that are saying, oh, people who support Bernie Sanders are just brainwashed kitty socialists, right? And then you have Bernie supporters. What are they saying of Trump supporters? That they're like these neo-fascists yeah, fascists, who like yeah. are, have, are, have no capability of thinking for themselves or whatever. There's probably, I mean, I'm not trying to make a political statement here. There's probably a lot of people who've been animated by pure emotion and aren't doing the ethical thinking for themselves. Or there are probably a lot of people in both camps who are, you know, pretty responsible in their thinking, right? So I don't know. I don't, by the way, I'm not endorsing yeah, we're not <laughs> any of those candidates. I'm not a political person, but we see that there. But the, the, the fact I mean, there are other places. I mean, can you think of other places in American society where we outsource our our thinking for us? Like, where where do we yeah. turn to for ethical advice? Like, no matter how much how much power we give, like actors. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry. Like talk show hosts. Talk show hosts, like talking heads. You know, mm-hmm. I like I'm sorry. Did the, where did these people get some like refined sense of ethics? Like, how did how did Rush Limbaugh or George Clooney develop the ability to tell me? what I should think and say. Like, did they get some sort of special training in that? Because, like, as far as I know... Right, like, where did they get that authority? Like, why should I be deferential to them? Right. Um, and maybe some people would say, well, why should we be deferential to you? We're not we're not espousing a viewpoint or a program or anything like that. But the point of what Simone's trying to say is you've got to do it for yourself. You've got to be a big boy and a big girl, and you can't let um, these idols determine what you're going to be ethically because then they may just reduce you to deer. And like, I don't know, I can't even think about like a smartphone, right? Like, instead of thinking things for yourself, you just automatically reach for like a simple, easy solution. Right. And why, I, mean, I guess the thing is, is, is why is that so important? Why is, why on the, on the existential viewpoint, why is it so important to do this thinking for ourselves? Just to bring it home, because this kind of bleeds into my third point. If, if our ethical models are, ex, are determined externally, what, then what, you know, I just want to bring back that F word, the good F word. What do we lose in that process if, if it's determined for us, for, for us externally? I was going to say functionality, but... <laughs> well, our true functions as humans, right, yeah. is to express our, our, our freedom, to express our ability to choose. And that's what deer can't do. They can choose to jump over the fence or to avoid that predator or run this way when they hear a gunshot. They have that kind of choice. They can zig and zag. Right. But they don't have the ability to enter into autonomous moral action. Mm-hmm. And what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say here is if we outsource our thinking to actors and talk show radio hosts and the communist leaders and things like that, um, there's a good chance that we're going to turn ourselves into animals. Well, yeah, and I think the... The issue that Simone really emphasizes is action is critical. So if you stop thinking for yourself, then you stop acting for yourself. 
Yeah, I mean, you really become passively determined by the things that are externally imposing. Yeah, themselves. and I really, I, I love that um, how the translator put here that you know men become a passive conductor of outside forces. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a great. That's a great way of saying it. Um, okay, so. So from moving on from the collectivist uh, critique of Simone de Beauvoir, she's where you know the kind of where do we go from here? Okay, so we so what do we know about the existentialist perspective? We know that it's got to be something about free moral choice, something that we do for ourselves that we can't outsource. It's got to have conditional values rather than unconditional values. Uh, we know it's not going to come from any anything like the church or the state or culture or anything like that. Um, so we're going to try to have to find a principle of universal action that correlates with this freedom of existentialist conversion. Now, now that's going to be a theme that we develop throughout the book. So she, Simone's got a lot of work to do um, in order to get there. Um, so I, let me see uh, what I want. I, I got to consult my notes. You got something you want to say there? Um, let's see. I so many things. Um, I guess for me, like one thing that I was wondering is. How, I guess what I'm trying, having a hard time wrapping my head around is sort of the, the movement that she talks about and like the direction of it. Um, just because in my own mind, when she says like positive and negative movement, I kind of tend to pump that up with my own preconceptions of that. What, what's the context again? Again, I'm not, you might have to bring in a particular um, passage. Let's see. Um, well, I guess uh, maybe more... Should we uh, movement of the self or... Yeah, sort of the movement movement? of the self. Like, is it kind of like a trajectory that she's talking about? Or I guess, like, I'm trying to think of it in more concrete terms well, than the just abstraction. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing is we talked about, like, when we did Augustine or whatever, the movement of the self was what? We talked about the movement of the self kind of going up and down this metaphysical chutes and ladders, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you could descend into hell or you could go to heaven or purgatory or limbo or mm -hmm. whatever... Um, or continue to exist in a terrestrial plane. Right. But on the existentialist perspective, there is no transcendental movement, mm -hmm. right? And in fact, if you did make that transcendental movement on the existentialist perspective, she may view that as negative. I don't. I have to look at that particular yeah. context for that passage. But the only positive real movement is the, are going to be internal movements. They're going to be mm -hmm. movements that internally justify our existence. So we're not justified as a result of where we fit on the metaphysical or divine schema. Mm -hmm. we're, so that we're, it's, we have to make these certain sort of involutions of the self, right? We have to make these evolutions within. Right. Those are going to be the positive movements. Um, and maybe we've said all we can say about what that principle of existential freedom is for the moment, because she she's going to start talking about... Um, in order to maybe bring out some of those tensions, she's going to start talking about children, right. interestingly enough. Um, and that this is going to sort of kind of help us to delimit some aspects of what the principle of action can and cannot do and, help, and, and sort of develop this further. So she's, she's going to maybe not give as more positive content here because she's got something to say about why individuals end up not actualizing existential freedom and from there she can draw out more which i think is really fascinating because what i want to do is essentially she's going to try to give an account here for like why people do bad things and this is going to be interesting because it's right. going to be a very different account from say why augustine said people do bad things so, yeah and we've got a lot of terrain to to cover in order to get there um so what i thought what was interesting is that existentialist freedom and conversion and ethical projects and things like that, when does she say that those can actually get going? Oh, gosh. Um, isn't it, like, pretty much based on the condition that people value freedom above all things? Right. right. And I guess we have to say, so when does that happen in our personal development? She says it can't happen right, so when. So it happens, it can't happen in childhood. Okay, so let's... So the crisis that brings that on is adult. Right. Okay. So, so we have to examine first before we can say uh, uh, anything about that. We have to say why can't we convert to existentialism um, in childhood, and what happens in adolescence that ushers in the conversion? I think you and I were watching. There's this thing that uh, what was it PBS or somebody had done? Like it's like talk to me like I'm five, and they were trying to explain oh, Nietzsche's yeah, existentialism yeah. to a bunch of kindergartners. Um, 
I think this is really fascinating. She talks about, she talks, she, she describes the, uh, she describes the, the, the condition of children. Um, I might be getting, I might be jumping ahead a little bit, but that's okay. I'll, I'll get all of it here. Let me put my glasses on. Um, what does she say the situation of children are? Remember, think back to when you were a child. For me, it was a long, it was much longer yeah. ago. It was a shorter, shorter gap. All right. Time. Okay. Yeah. So what does she say the situation of the child is? It's cool because she says that we're brought into this universe, which we have absolutely no role in shaping. We're just kind of plopped in it. And our, like, the values are, are prepackaged. So we're given the values that our parents, our teachers give to us. Like I was thinking about it, um, you know, like the example like of a stove, right? Your parents always yell at you, like, stay away from the stove. But as you get older and when you're hungry and you want to cook things, uh, the, the stove is your friend because you can use it to make delicious food. Um, so that's the sort of thing that, but, you know, when you're younger, you import that value judgment of the stove as a scary, dangerous thing that you need to stay away from. Right. So I am jumping all over my notes, so I'm going to have to revisit some things. But the idea here is that when you're a child, when you're a child, you think that there are absolutized values, right, right. that are handed, and you treat your parents like gods, yes. right? Mm -hmm. So essentially, they like when they say "don't touch that stove" or do, "don't do this" or "don't do that," mm -hmm. it's the same as sort of like God talking to Moses on the mountaintop and handing down right. the tablets. Yeah. So we we tend to think of the world as being composed of these. Um, inviolable moral commands that are handed down by gods or whatever, right? And so, what? It, and what's really interesting, I love the fact that she explores the subjectivity of children in that scenario. Because, all right, so what's the difference between children and you and me? How did? How did? Like, how do they comport their life versus what? How you and I comport our lives? Or maybe people will say this about me, though, because a lot of people say that I'm a man child, right? <laughs> and maybe you would say that about yeah. me too, but. Like, she, what does she say the effect of having immutable values does? I mean, it kind of, it, it frees you up just because you don't have to, like, really think or worry about how your actions affect other people or the world. Everything's defined for you, right? Exactly. So it's uh, like, hey, as long as I just operate within this, like, framework, as long as I don't touch the stove, don't burn the house down, don't punch or shove my sibling, like, siblings around, then I'm good. Right, so so you all the thinking is done for you. Right. All right, but if all the thinking is done for you, what conclusion do you draw from that? Even in, if you're like five years old, she says this is a conclusion that you draw. If if the parents set, if parents are gods and they set the boundaries for what is right and wrong, how much does what you do matter? You, yeah, I mean, like your actions have like absolutely no significance. So she says that children know. They realize that. They, she, yeah, this is a huge point. She says that children know that they don't matter. And when they know Which that... so interesting. She says when children know that they don't matter, it allows them to joyfully embrace their irrelevance and their irresponsibility. It's why children can just like daydream and, and skip and do things that don't matter because they know in the big adult world, they don't, ma they, they don't contribute anything to it. And I, 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 yeah, I, and like she, she mentions that like their role is just minimized to respecting and obeying. Right. So, and she calls this. She has a name for this condition that children are in. Do you know? Do you remember what she calls uh, no, it? I don't have it in my notes. Gosh, I am jumping all over the place. But she calls that metaphysical privilege. That's right. Yeah. Right. Like she calls it metaphysical privilege. Right. Um, and uh, that is a really fascinating point um, because, A, I think, like, there's some truth to it. Um, but she's going to get into some potentially very controversial territory with this idea of, of, of metaphysical privilege, right? And the fact that it results – she also says – you should say this – Ironically, 
She says that individuals that experience a state of metaphysical privilege take the values that are ready-made and handed down to them, take, they take them very seriously. They don't doubt them. So in a way, she says that they are serious, but mm -hmm. ironically right. says they're serious, right? So, so they kind of, rem they're kind of um, in their infantilized state, they take these values very seriously, but then it doesn't make them serious people. It makes them very juvenile, right? Right. Which is a very strange way of using the word serious. They take the values seriously, but they themselves are not no. serious. Well, yeah, I mean, because they can't be taken. All right, so, so here, here is the massive landmine, yeah, and he's like, I don't think we can really avoid it, no. and because it is, it is so controversial, it's, and and it's, and it's like yeah. the second we love this idea that Simone like brings into the conversation yeah. about about seriousness, we're kind of fine with t t talking about children this way because we all were once children. Everybody is a child, and we can't escape it. Right. And she explains the utility of, you know, using this model to keep children safe. Right. And I think that, I, I think the question is, if you look at children who are like, I think it would be really interesting is to test this idea out. I think this would be really a tremendous sociological, psychological situation, and it, it's horrific. But, you know, you and I probably grew up with pretty fortunate and blessed childhoods, Right. It'd be interesting to see if the anxiety of existentialism um, affects children at younger ages if they experience more trauma or a harder life or something mm -hmm. like that. Like, for instance, like, are children in Syria right now, are they experiencing something way different? Are therefore having to, you know how they say some people have to grow up fast? Yeah, that's exactly what I was saying. If thinking. there's early onset adolescence, which we'll talk about here in a second. Right. So... So what does she say that's so controversial? You, I think it, it's probably less controversial if you say it. Yeah, I mean, so then she takes this one step further and then applies this um, infantile state to uh, slaves in the 19th century in America and women. So why? Which so I why did issue with both? All right, so set it up. Let's be, let's be fair to Simone. How does she think that the situation of the child in metaphysical privilege is similar to people who? have been enslaved and women who have been oppressed. How, do, how, does she, how does she draw that? Well, it's the same um, sort of box, right? Is that you have these um, predetermined or sort of circumscribed values of, you know, laws, customs, certain gods that uh, everyone has to obey, but especially for uh, slaves and women, they had absolutely no say in shaping Right. So like, so for women and slaves or whatever, it's like they had to do it. Like, because a lot of times there were very like physical ramifications to that. Right. right? So, yeah. So, but, but what's the other, ram if there are these external absolutes imposed by men and slave masters and things like that, mm -hmm. then what does she say is going to be the subjectivity of enslaved people and women? Uh, sorry, can you rephrase that? What it, it, so if the, these things are externally defined by force and segregation mm -hmm. and, oppression and things like that, what does she think is going to be the, the correlate to that in terms of the, the grown subjectivity right. so, of I these mean, oppressed people? But I guess at some point, then, they can never truly be adults because, again, like, their actions really don't really, I, I don't want to say matter, but, like, in terms of um, de Beauvoir, like, they don't have as much of an impact because if you take a population... And if you like make sure that they have a very minimalized function in society, then they can't bear that much of importance in terms of like you know governance or anything like social, like e economic, like absolutely. But they're gonna yeah. they're gonna see that they don't make much of a contribution to the way that that world is set up, right? Right. And exactly. They, and like I th I th I think the thing is is she's concerned that minorities and women may be viewed as frivolous and and childlike in nature. Right. Okay. So we've set it up. Those are, and I say this in my lecture, I'm not endorsing that view because like right. of the, the terrible sort of political ramifications of it or whatever. Right. And also, I think it's probably an oversimplification and massively reductionist because I don't, know, I don't know how you can get to a certain sort of cognitive development and still not be able to see through that the, the, these external constraints are not um, 
fabricated and man-made. Because I mean, I mean, like, I mean there are plenty of women who've been oppressed and there have been plenty of people who were enslaved that were very grown up and not like, you know, engaging in the worst stereotypes that we associate with those things. But I guess I wanted to see, because you are a woman, mm-hmm. and I wanted you, and, and this is a woman who's issuing this, she's pretty much indicting her own gender on some level. How did this affect your view of what Simone is saying? Do you think there's any legitimacy to what she's saying? Like, I'm not touching it with a 10-foot pole, but I feel like you might be able to say a little bit more to it. I think that there are a couple things that I had to really, like, think about or keep in mind. And the context is the fact that, um, you know, she grew up in a very privileged environment. Uh, so, you know, she was affluent. That definitely helped. And another context to really, uh, remember this is the fact that colonialism was, like, you know, like, when was this? In, like, written in the 1940-something. That's just the front. I, I'd have to look at the copyright. Right. So basically, but, I mean, colonialism was <laughs> definitely governed how, you know, like, everyone in Europe thought about you know, slaves and people that they were trying to subjugate. So when you're trying to subjugate people then and control people, it makes sense to place them in a childlike state of, oh, they are incapable of making decisions. So personally, um, <laughs> I obviously do not agree with this, but the lens in which she is saying this stuff does make sense. Like, she might chastise a housewife, but you know, today, um, Luke and I were talking about this off mic about the expense of childcare. I mean, uh, I think in Massachusetts and Minnesota, and I think New York, a woman spends a third of her income on childcare. Yeah. And she makes 77 cents to every man's dollar. So there are choices that women, because of these social constructs we have, need to make and these are the kind of decisions that Simone may chastise a woman for but there's a much more complicated picture behind things that Simone is making judgments on. Are you saying so So the problem is is that <clears throat> because this is such a controversial passage in the book mm-hmm. the problem is is that I think there are a lot of people who want to reject it in its entirety right, right? And, that, and, and I guess the question I'm asking you is ought it to be can it no, be both think, right and wrong? I just don't think it. I don't think it captures the complexity of the situation. Right, I completely agree, and I think that by dismissing these kind of issues and not talking about them, just puts it on a shelf and just kind of allows you to skirt around the issue, like race and sex. And I don't want to talk about it in a race and a sex perspective, but I'm happy to apply it to the white male perspective. So I have right. no, I have no problem raking my own kind across across the coals or whatever, like. There are plenty of of childlike men, right? Um, as and and I think the question is, is why are there so many childlike men? And um, I think you have you have to sort of. I, I think Simone's investigation of this can prove very fruitful or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Is that there is sort of this um, Casanova culture that is posited. There is sort of this 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 totem pole of importance that is positive and whatnot. And if you just sort of take that as like what it is, it's very easy to be a, a disrespectful child as a white man. Right. I, and I'll, I'll even go one step further. Jordan, I have been a disrespectful child mm-hmm. when at the moments when I was, at the moments where I was uh, most likely to hand over my ethical autonomy to externally imposed ready-made values, that's when I was an entitled brat. Now, I'm not going to say anything about, else about minority groups or women or anything like that, but I'll say it's very easy for grown-ass men to be little jerks. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, it's easy to say, oh, well, that's the way things are, and to sort of buy into a system. Yeah. I've lost many... Especially if you are the one who reaps the most advantage from it. Yeah. I've Absolutely. Lo- like that, yeah. I've lost many friends at, in, the, in the playground mm-hmm. of life because I was incapable of having flexible values that can be integrated with others. Mm -hmm. Like I have, I think we're probably all guilty of this to some extent with our, it's very easy to get in in myopically sort of uh, ensconced in uh, political dogmatism 
And I think it's very easy to kick dirt in the eyes of someone that we don't like. Right. You know, or to just, you know, go off in the corner and gossip and like have an us versus them sort of mentality and not recognize the sort of unity of mankind. Right. And I think that it's, it's very easy to uh, make a group of people like the other. And yeah. Otherize people. Well, and someone's going to be very against that, right? Because like the whole idea of the existential program is it's the reason why she mentions the reason why she mentions oppressed peoples, the reason why she mentions women and minorities is not to say is not to further marginalize them. Right. She wants to take them out of that other right. she status. She wants to bring them into the fold. Right. But it, at the same time, does it? She means well, but does it strike you as condescending? Is it patronizing? Will you? Are you not willing to listen to her the way that she talks about it? Yeah, I mean, I was kind of rubbed the wrong way, but you have, like, I really do just try to keep in mind the context of she's a very privileged woman, so she didn't have to worry about, like, earning wages. You know, I mean, if she really wanted to, she could have easily had her parents bankroll her, she could have married and had a husband provide for her, um, that sort of thing. And... You know, with uh, France especially, I mean, they were a huge colonial heavyweight. So those those worldviews are going to frame the way that she's going to think about things and the way that she's going to discuss these things. Yeah. So I think in terms of the intention, she wants to incorporate them. Um, but from uh, a more modern standpoint, this is something like, you know? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's highly controversial. I think there's probably a way, if someone would want to turn this into a paper... A master's thesis or something like that. I think if you dealt with this particular uh, passage in the ethics of ambiguity, I think you could. Co- I think you could probably get a lot of attention. And yeah. if you handled it the right way, you could turn yourself into a rock star academic. But tread very carefully. That's all. That's yeah, all I have yeah. to say about this. All right, let's move on from that because uh, I think we could go on and on and on about it. Right, we but can, it, we can connected can back to this issue, the good news is whether you're a child one of these marginalized peoples or whatever, mm-hmm. she doesn't say that you're stuck there forever, right? right? That's the beautiful thing about this. It's not that it's like, it's not that you're otherized and you're forever infantilized. You typically, if, if we're just talking about children, there's going to be a period of crisis where you exit out of the state of metaphysical privilege. Mm-hmm. And when does she say that this crisis occurs? It's when you, is it pretty much when you start to realize that your actions have an impact yeah, and what she she gives sort of a developmental state to that. Uh, let's see. What it, it, she says it occurs in adolescence. That that this is like a crucial sort of right. crossroads in adolescence. Adolescence is not so much a psychological, yeah, it's when biological. You, start to realize, you know these sources of authority like uh, parents, teachers, coaches, that they aren't always right, and that they aren't perfect, and that they don't have this sort of godlike, uh, you know, quality or perfection to them. Yeah, it's like so when you, it, when you start to come into contact with other viewpoints other than your own and you realize the absolute complexity of the world, <clears throat> that you start to, well, maybe my parents were wrong, maybe my mentor was wrong, maybe this thing was wrong. Right, you start second guessing. Maybe I was wrong, right? But like I being like a previous version of yourself. I guess the question is, in our society today, when does this happen? Is this, is this college? Is this? Yeah, I, I, that's kind of what I was thinking. You're just, you know, you just graduated. Is college adolescence in America now, where you come together with all these people who have diverging viewpoints, and you're like, oh my god, these ideologies are so conflicting. Maybe my parents were hyper liberal, and I right. encounter a conservative in my philosophy class, and like, I know they're smart, but they think totally different from me, and like, what's going on here? Like, they're not stupid. How do I? What? Ha- what's happening here? Or maybe you're like from the backwoods of of some place and you encounter a liberal for the first time and you're like, yeah. they're smart and they're making some good points. I don't know how to reconcile these things. It causes this, right. this it's existential a, crisis right. with it. Absolutely. I feel like that's, that's when this happens is it is in college. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. There's like this really great um, quotation and I don't have the entire thing, but, but it also, fantastic. It's, these, she says that an adolescent becomes the prey of freedom. Yeah, 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 yeah. So and what do you think? Totally, that is what do you totally think, college. What do you think that means? Do you think like freedom is like devouring the child? Yeah, it, potentially. It, like it can potentially become this all-consuming thing, and sometimes you know you can be so overwhelmed by your own 
freedom, you can become paralyzed by it. Well, you know the interesting thing is, too, and maybe this is... A lot of that's bound up with, I think, the fear of failure. Yeah. The thing is, I wonder if college is the place, too, because there's also this post-grad syndrome or quarter Mm -hmm. life crisis thing that people talk about. Yeah. Like, I definitely went through a quarter life Mm -hmm. crisis where I was like... Because in college, it's kind of like a limbo period. Like, you're on, on on one hand, you're getting all these new viewpoints that you're trying to synthesize with your own, but, like a lot of the values that you're brought up with sort of remain the same. Like, mm-hmm. like being smart is right. the ultimate value and getting good grades is the ultimate value and right. being an intellectual is the ultimate value. And then you and I get out in the real world and what happens, Jordan? Oh, you fall flat on your face. We, you and I. Yeah, because then you have to think about, actually, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's like the post-grad that's like the maybe real that, maybe crisis. That's... Because if you think about it, you know, in a way you have like the metaphysical privilege, you kind of get that you know, financial, like, you get that economic privilege to an extent, you know, like, you get loans and everything, you know, but you get, you have that. You're shielded that from the real world. Right, exactly. You're kind of like, well, you know, I have a meal plan. Awesome. Cool. Like, I get financial aid. Awesome. Um, you know, I'm going like, to be a doctor awesome. one day. I'm going to be a lawyer one day. I'm going to, like, marry Prince Charming one day. Or I'm going to be a rock star one day. Like, we still have these one-day heroic things that we aspire to or everything's right. going to be taken care of. I wonder well, if you still, still you still have that in college though. To yeah, degree, you know? that's what I'm I saying. Mean, is like, are we still children in college? Yeah, I because I would say I mean you're so maybe that's why you know I don't know if we can do a little self assessment. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I I mean you're you're a post grad now. Yeah. I mean what's mm-hmm. what's it like? I mean do you do you, is any <laughs> of this is is any of this resonating with you? I, you might oh, actually yeah, be absolutely. more advanced than yeah. me. Yeah, I mean I might be more. Um, I think I kind of feel this more acutely too because you know like your values kind of tend to shift to once you're like kind of like oh gosh I have to start bankrolling myself <laughs> yeah, it became, yeah there's so a sense you of start urgency. to call your own values into question a long way not entirely but you know just some things like maybe you become like a little bit more stingy like at the grocery store oh do you want to donate one dollar to this cause oh I'll have to pass for today you know just those little things, you know, that you have to kind of pivot on a little bit. You know, yeah, I would say that I was actually, and what's interesting about this notion of adolescence, it can be delayed. It yeah. can be delayed, delayed, I delayed. Kinda, I, I think, think it's delayed. Because I went, to, so like you and I, I'm 12 years older than you, but I, we have a lot in common. Yeah. Right? Like you and I, I don't understand, like I don't think that we're different, but yeah. like, I think that probably speaks to the fact that I delayed adolescence by going, but I never really got out of school. Like I just kind of kept, I mean, I I took some breaks in between grad programs and things like that, but like I really just kept kicking the can down the road and kept staying in college. And I don't, I think that's why a lot of people, if I, I mean, look, I'll be real. I don't care. People know what I am. I think there's a lot, that's why a lot of people view me as kind of this man child is because I'm still living in a world of abstract ideas and good grades and being smart. Right. And like the world out there tells me that I don't have any value. Right. I'm not useful to society to reference mm-hmm. a podcast yeah. or two ago. Uh, and so I think you could probably make the case that I'm still an adolescent in some ways. I know I don't, I don't want, I don't want to, yeah, broad, like I don't want to broad. Level. Yeah, mm-hmm. on, on the on, on some wonderful laws of you, I may right. still be an adolescent. Mm-hmm. And the way she talks about women and, and minorities and things like that, they could be my age, younger, older, and stuff like that, and they could right. still be in that sort of twilight of, of, of adolescence mm-hmm. because, right. like, we aren't really etching and making our mark upon the world. We're still, like, living in this ready-made universe of values. Mm-hmm. So there might be, like, I guess when she... she Simone might say there's no difference between 36-year-old Luke Johnson and, like, a plantation slave in, like, you know, 1820. Yeah, because I was kind of, like, wonder, what, when you have that moment of recognition, um, oh, my gosh, like, I'm stuck in this system, is that, like, how do you see your way out of it, you know? Well, that's a, that's a I mean, that... Well, is that the point, is that, like, the crisis when you realize oh my god, everything around me is just, like, fabricated, and, like, what do I do? Well, yeah, I mean, living in the Washington, D.C. area and and seeing how much it, emphasis it puts on financial value, like, I don't have, my intellect is not valued here, right? When I was in Athens, I, lo- I love telling this story. When I lived in Athens, Georgia, they have a totally different, it's an insulated bubble as well. Right. So, like, in Athens, Georgia, it's, it's, a very, it's a very economically depressed place. 
place. Mm-hmm. And people don't really care that much about money and things like that. So like, so like, it's all about artistic creation. And like, right. you can be very high on the totem pole there and be like in a cool van and serving coffee somewhere. Right. Right. But, and like when I was in Athens, Georgia, I felt like a big fish. Mm-hmm. Right. And I come back here to DC. I am so insignificant in the eyes of people in DC. You know, like they're like, you went and got a PhD. Like, why? Why? Like, that's so worthless in our mm-hmm. society. And I think that's where the friction comes. If you put yourself in new scenarios and new people right. and they start calling mm-hmm. to question your entire life project, that's when you have to reassert the values that you make and do them for internally justifying reasons. I think you've got to make yourself oh, yeah, un- you have to uncomfortable. Kind of, you have to, like, you have to ground yourself. Yeah. In, like, your own self-worth yeah totally that's what she's gonna say i think the best way to know if you're doing it is if you're if you continue to assert those values in a place where people are telling you that you're valueless Mm -hmm. and i think truthfully if there is anything honorable in what we're doing i think it's that we're probably getting a little personal um uh i don't know yeah yeah but i I think it's good you know i think it's good that people understand the pragmatic import of what we're talking about and maybe there's a lot of people that can identified with this young people people in grad school people who don't know what their skill sets are and how to apply them you know i think there's probably a lot of value in that um so she's she just to tie a little bit of a bow on on this thing about childhood and adolescence and metaphysical privilege and stuff like that i didn't get to the point i I stopped here at page 40 but she she's going to talk about how when we do get to that crisis point the decisions that we make there these deci- right. are, are going to be decisions that we serve forever. Like I, last time I used the analogy of like making ethical choices was like getting a tattoo. Right. Like, so she's going to say that when we enter into this crisis period in adolescence, when we start to see that our values aren't forever endurable and like, um, or enduring, I should say, and that, that professors and parents and everything like that aren't gods that actually they can be very mistaken It's the decisions that we make in that crisis that then we sort of etch themselves onto our souls. So she's going to say that if we develop bad character, it's a result of how we respond to this crisis. So, Right, which is super interesting. How does that differ from, like, say, how Augustine talks about how we develop bad character? What did he say? Like, when we became bad people in Augustine's view, why was it that we became bad? Well, it's because we strayed from the path that God had to we weren't using our reason to connect up to wisdom to figure out how we are to comport ourselves right, exactly. in the world. So we basically kind of like and what did we give into? In order to desire, so basically we're sort of blinded by our own overwhelming uh, desires, and we kind of lose the ability to sort of calibrate where we're going and how to. I guess you could say like navigate, you know, your morality towards like truth and wisdom and ultimately. Right. Like, so oh, there is no God. Like I almost think of it kind of like, you know, you're laying a foundation for a house or like I, I kind of thought of it in terms of Legos, I guess maybe childhood and like adolescence. You know, like when how you deal with this kind of like lays each little like block down and then that ultimately builds who you are. Right. Right. Like so so it's like like so if we have evil people in the world in that existential crisis, they just made some bad decisions. Right. So do you, I mean, do you like that view? I mean, the thing is, is it, 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 it kind of, I mean, it kind of exonerates the bad people, right? Like it, like, Hit, yeah. like Hitler just made, just responded poorly to personal crisis. Right. Like, like I, I wasn't Hitler trying to be an artist or something like that. Isn't yeah, that the story? Yeah. And he didn't get into art school and he just, Oh, <laughs> sorry about the intercom, but maybe Hitler just didn't deal with that existential crisis correctly, right? Like, mm-hmm. but that, doesn't that then make evil? So what that does is it it diminishes the scariness of evil men, right? Hitler doesn't become evil incarnate; he's just a culmination of bad existential choices. Because there is no evil incarnate because there are no values. Right. I kind of tend to think of it in terms of Augustine, though, of, like, you can define what is good off of, it, like, defining the positive off of the negative, if that makes sense. Elaborate on that. I mean, it's kind of like 
with, um, you know, like God's judgment and how you need free choice in order for God to have value judgments and impose judgments on your soul. It's kind of like we assume that role of God in that, in a way, you can't, do you need that evil, right, in order to understand what's, like, good and, like, what's laudable behavior yeah. and what's praiseworthy? I think she thinks that there is, you don't need God in order to determine what's good and evil. She, I think she feels, much like Kierkegaard, she that the individual understands in that period of existential crisis that they have two choices, right? Mm -hmm. That they can assert their ethical existence, right? And try to be what they conceive to be a good person and integrate that with other people's disclosings of self. Mm -hmm. Or they can shy away from it because of the despair of not right. choosing. Mm -hmm. And in the, the individuals of the bad people... Right. And she calls it the, the anguish of freedom. Yeah, the, the, that they give into that despair. And I think she'll go on later in the book to talk about, mm -hmm. like submen and this and that and how they can be right. co-opted for movements and things like that but i guess i guess my only problem with this is that it makes it it make doesn't it make like nazis and things like that like sympathetic figures they're not it, they just they're they're human beings they're they're, they're they're human beings that incorrectly responded to the existential challenge i think it makes them more accountable right because if they had that choice to make those decisions and go down that path doesn't that make them worse than saying oh well i mean oh boy um <laughs> there was obviously like a ton of coercion and fear and threat of violence and actual violence that coerced a lot of people to join the party and to get behind the movement um but i think the people that chose it by their own volition that that makes them even more accountable because they actively chose to participate in it. Yeah. You know, it's, I, That's you know, how I see it. It's, we, it's a weird way to think about it. And it, I, I guess that, I guess they, uh, I guess what's, uh, she also says something very interesting about this, not necessarily here, but she, she'll say later in the book that we may have this sort of medieval bloodlust to draw and quarter mm -hmm. like war criminals, like Nazis right. and things like that. But what does she say we can't do? Precisely that, right? Yeah, yeah. Why, I mean, like why, can't, why does she say that we can't do that? I mean, I'm, I would assume... We can't just, like, execute them on the spot. Well, yeah, because then at that point you just become as terrible as they are. Like, right. You have, to, you have the choice to treat them in a somewhat equitable or, like, you have fair to, way. You have to give them, like, fair but trials. Fair trial, yeah, like, like, you, you have to give them... You have to, them up and shoot them execution style. You, you, yeah, you can't mow you them can't down. You can't stoop to their level, basically. Is right. What it says. Like, you have to be, like existential or like ethical adult in the room yeah you have to properly contextualize them and adjudicate them and afford them the dignity that they never afforded the victims of their heinous right. crime mm -hmm. which is laudable it's just that i don't know if i had lost family members to a holocaust or something like that i don't know if i would have that sort of restraint yeah yeah what's interesting this ties in and maybe we don't have to imagine a holocaust but maybe she talked in this and i think probably this would be the last thing that we should talk about here is she talks a little bit about suicide and, and, and capital punishment and stuff like that. So tell us a little bit more about what existential freedom is. She'll tell us that, that people who have, or have been existentially converted do have ethical projects and things like that. Um, the important thing is to be malleable and to adapt. And in my lecture series, what I talk about is like all my life, I sort of had dedicated myself to being successful in music, kept hitting, having door slammed in my face, door slammed in my face. And she says that there's, no harm in acknowledging that that effort is futile, right? And at some point, in order to live a more vital life or whatever, we have to break up mm -hmm. with that aspect of ourselves and move on to new endeavors and reassert our disclosing and freedom in different ways. But what's interesting from that, what she says about that, she draws the conclusion that the worst, what does she say the worst possible punishment is for somebody who, on the, on the, ethical existentialist perspective is it's life imprisonment why isn't that crazy yeah. why does she say it's at life imprisonment i think it's because you just you live in a fixed state and you have like very little like room for any sort of like development or movement or improvement you, you cannot reassert your values in a conditional way right. every because that's why action for her is so important if you're in a setting where you can't act differently to influence you know like your sort of like movement so to speak then you're just stuck. Right. She sees every single day is going to be the exact same for you. If you are imprisoned. It's like Groundhog Day. 
Yeah, if you're imprisoned for life or whatever, everything is ready-made and determined for you. You are, you even have less, you probably have less freedom than the deer in the running wild in nature. Yeah, you, you have can't been, even determine your like physical like location pretty much. You're right. You, your own physical memory. And, it's, and it, I think part of, part of the reason why life imprisonment is so miserable is that you know, like if, if a cow was like in a pin mm -hmm. and couldn't move around, the cow doesn't understand that there's anything better. The cow doesn't understand that it could like be asserting its freedom in all these different possible ways where it could be a, a sculptor or a, a microbiologist or, or a podcaster or whatever else, right? Mm -hmm. The cow is just like, I'm just a cow. I'm just chewing my cut. I don't ha I, I'm just this thing. It's, I'm not advocating putting cows in pens. But what I'm saying is if you put a human in a pen like that, yeah. like the, the existential insanity that they will experience – will will drive them to madness right and this leads to the other thing about so she's going to say that that life imprisonment is worse than capital punishment why is it worse than capital punishment because I mean, capital punishment does what it gives you like some sort of like freedom like you can kind of like you can break you can get escape from this pen right exactly like for me like okay so i'm 22 and if I went to prison, if I had like a life sentence, I'd say, okay, so I'm going to spend the next 60, who knows, 60, like what, 70, maybe 80 years of doing the exact same thing every single day. Yeah. Yeah, so, I just so feel she, like, just kill me now. She, so she, capital punishment would be a reprieve from life in prison. Right. So I, wanna, I think it'd be kind of interesting to talk about that, whether or not how that shapes our political views. But what else does she say? If we do find our ourselves in a situation that we can't break out of, yeah. right? What does she say is a legitimate option? Well, suicide. She says that yeah. we can kill ourselves. And that's, and that's such like what such a Roman thing to do. Like, what do you think about that? Um, I think that... Do you, are, this is, like, this is, this is turning a lot of things on our head because right, she's yeah. saying life imprisonment is more harsh than capital punishment. Right. And she's saying in some very selected – she's not saying – she doesn't want people to go around killing themselves if their right. boyfriend broke up with them right. or their girlfriend broke up with them or something like that or if they lost their job or something like that. Because in those scenarios, you can always reassert your values and freedom and craft new life for yourself. Right. But if there is a situation where you can absolutely not break out of – and it would probably be worth discussing what those situations are. Maybe life imprisonment. Maybe, maybe a terminal diagnosis or something like that. Right. Uh, Probably, maybe not even that, because you can probably still find value in it. And probably you can find value in life imprisonment. Like, the human imagination is such that, like... Or, like, can... or think about, like, threat of torture. Or, like, okay, like, Seneca, he killed himself. Yeah. And basically, like, Emperor said, okay, you have two options. Either, like, I kill you, or you kill yourself. And he said, okay, I'll kill myself. Um, an example I really liked was this one uh, Roman freedwoman who was implicated in this conspiracy... And they tortured a bunch of men, and they all like squealed. They were just like, okay, well, okay, I will literally tell you anything to make this stop. And she just would not break under torture. And they left her alone, and she killed herself. Hmm. So you can, and I think Simone would, like, commend this woman. I think her name was Epicarus. And I think to Simone, she would say that, you know, this is, like, perfectly laudable because she's dying with, conviction and she's determining her own path mm. like she had no she was probably going to die anyway from torture but she took her own life uh before that could happen so i mean these are we, we hit i think we've hit more controversial sh subjects in <laughs> this in this podcast than we have yeah, in like any ever. other one that we've yeah. ever done yeah uh, how did the did she change your view i mean what was your do you mind if I ask what your view was on capital punishment before reading this? Uh, yeah, I would say that um, it's something that I definitely would endorse. Uh, it's so, something that seems primitive to me. I've been reading a lot on um, Aboriginal and American Indian justice, and in my mind, it's it doesn't really fix the problem. But what's interesting about this, right, is that if you are inclined towards the view that murderers should be um, held, be given life imprisonment sentences rather than capital punishment. You may be doing that for one reason, but and you might look at Simone as an ally, a political ally, right? right? 
But she's saying, no, life imprisonment is more inhumane than capital punishment. Mm -hmm. So there is an aspect of vengeance in life imprisonment that's worse than firing squad. How does that make you feel? Because mm -hmm. now, so, so life imprisonment, it's actually, I think it's uh, on this view, killing someone would be merciful by comparison. Yeah, I mean, I think especially with, like, death row, though, like, there are a lot of people who are on there, like, before DNA. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. If our... So, I think, okay, well, let me let me say this. If our criminal justice system were better, then I think I'd be able to get on board with it. So, does that make sense? Yeah. But right now, there are so many flukes, and our system is so backwards to begin with, I can't really... Get on board with it. Well, so I but this yeah. muddies the waters, right? Because we right. always people, people when we get into heated political debates about capital punishment, we the part of, like people who are purists like say that capital punishment is inhumane, right? right? Mm -hmm. But what Simone is saying here is is that she don't just, don't she completely inverts it. She flips it. Yeah. Don't don't think of yourself as high and mighty. Life imprisonment right. like is also in yeah. is also inhumane. So you've got two inhumane choices. Now the now the, the thing is you're 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 like okay they're both inhumane or I would make the case that maybe life imprisonment is more inhumane than capital punishment, mm -hmm. but because of the possibility for error, we still ought to go with the more inhumane thing because you don't because right. it would be the so so you if you were to schematize this, killings an innocent person is the most inhumane. Then life imprisonment for someone who is guilty, right. and then killing someone who is guilty, mm -hmm. in terms of humanity of the situation. Right. But again, did you see how it got so ethically complex yeah. there? Yeah, uh, and I think that's why we do it. Why I think we do that philosophy. depends on even like what the like prisoner ascribes to, like what their values are. Yeah, I mean that's an interesting thing too, because like some people are like I'm ready to die, and some people go out of this world yeah. kicking and screaming too. Mm -hmm. uh, what did what do, you, what do you think about her view of suicide? Um, Do you feel like it glorifies that, it too easily or too much? No, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think it's just something that I'm much more attuned to because I the, have studied the classics. The, the Roman situation. Yeah, so, I mean, the for, in like Roman thought, suicide was an act of manifesting your own will. And I think that's kind of what Simone is touching on, is that an act of suicide can be an act well and you can confirm your own existence in obliterating it. I'm very hesitant to endorse her view on this. I see where she's coming from. I, yeah. But I'm I, very I think on a person like intellectually I understand it, um, but on a like on an emotional like level, I, I don't know if I can I, I don't know if I can back that horse. Yeah, I think I see I worked a and I'll close I should probably shut up here after this because it's a minute an hour and oh, seven <laughs> minutes. Uh I, I'm hesitant to endorse the suicide view because I used to work with a suicide or distantly worked with a, a suicide prevention philanthropy and um, and I've done a lot of suicide right. prevention work and it's I, I just really worry that someone who may be in a dark place would read these words and and not understand the hope that she's trying to give through the existentialist perspective, but we'll see the justification right. for an like, act I think, that they already I think want to do. Right, I there should be like an asterisk, you know what I mean? Of yeah. like, this is the absolute last of yeah. the last. You've tried last, everything absolute else. Absolute last resort. And I think for Simone, she advocates, you have so many tools in your box. Use all of them. And I think you're totally right. That's someone that is not um, emotionally in a healthy or stable place would just say, there we go. I've exhausted all my options, all my tools. I've tried using them, and they haven't worked. Well, I think it would probably be worthwhile to say like what those options are. I don't think Simone would ever endorse the idea of like, like you and I. Like, let's say we go through a depressive state or something like that, and we're just like, maybe we should just kill ourselves. I don't think she would ever endorse that. No, she'd be like, look, you have so many opportunities to I redefine think, yourself. Right, and I think that that she would say that that's despair yeah. speaking, yeah. not I've exhausted all. I guess the question becomes, right, let's say I go through a really depressive state and you do everything you can to get me out of it. And I just, I just still, I'm just like, I just don't want to live anymore. Mm -hmm. At some point, 
you know, I, I don't want to, at some point, are you being unethical by continuing to try to make me want to live? Are you infantilizing me? Are you, defi- are you trying to become this God in my life that is constantly trying to save right. me from my own existence? Yeah. And, and maybe, and maybe in that scenario where the person has tried everything like that, I mean, maybe you could talk about maybe suicide is the, the, the humane thing to help somebody with. But I don't want to speculate on that too much. We probably because honestly, God, that's an issue. Just like all the other issues in this one, I probably shouldn't be talking about them uh, with a ten foot pole or touching them with a ten foot pole. But I, I, I can see a lot of complications with it. Yeah, the, the point I want to read: this text is a very hopeful text. Yeah, it is. It's not about oppressed minorities and capital punishment and right. suicide. All, but there, there is. We got kind of hung up on these details today. I hope people aren't going to get too depressed and. Right. <laughs> And think and that stop this, listening. Yeah, this is all going to be about uh, resignation, surrender, or whatever. All right. I, I think I've talked about everything that I had notes for. I, today was – I kind of jumped around in my notes. I usually follow my notes pretty linearly, but I think we kind of threaded it together yeah, still pretty well. Stretch. I mean, is there anything – Franken podcast. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Uh, I think that's it. It okay. does. It does get better. <laughs> We've talked about a lot of difficult things, but stay with us. It's heavy. Yeah. This is a heavy that's podcast bad. today, wasn't it? Yeah. But Simone, she's a heavyweight. She is. She, she is. Think about these things. She is. All right. I'm done. Hey. Okay, I think we're done. Yeah, go donate. Yeah. Over and out. Right, bye. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs>